my boss retired and um, I was a bit disappointed in this because I liked him and we got on well together and I didn't, didn't like the idea of a new bloke coming in and bossing me around and I honestly thought of resigning. But when he retired, to my astonishment, the head of EMI named me as his successor and I became head of Parliament Records. And um, I then had the whole label to, to cope with. It was a small label, but even so. And I, so I was doing everything. I was jazz records and choral records and orchestral records all, and children's records, all sorts of things. Did that conflict with your, you mentioned this was your day job, you were passionless as a, as a musician, as a composer. Did you feel as though this job was taking you away from where you thought you were headed? No, because I thought, because I was so, I was so, I fell for this business. I was hooked. You know, it was Abbey Road Studios in the 50s it was like a, a giant toy shop for me. It had all the music that you could ever want to see or hear and all the musicians. And I was on hobnobbing terms with all the great musicians. I loved it. And I didn't honestly think about um, what the future would hold. I just wanted to make the best records I could. We had a problem in that Parlophone was a very little label and had no, no major stars. So I had to find a way through everything else to get something selling. And I decided to go in and make comedy records. And I got to know Peter Sellers very well. And I started making records with him, which were very, very successful. And also Spike Milligan, the other goon. And lots of English and Australian people like Rolf Harris came along. And I became known as the comedian's producer. That was long before the Beatles. I had my first number one with a jazz band called the Temperance Seven. What year was that? That must have been around about 1959. And um, I was looking for a group. Nori Paramore, my, one of my um, rivals on Columbia, had a young man called Cliff Richard. And I envied him because it seemed that anything that Cliff could sing would, was a hit. You know, give him God Save the Queen, he'd make it a hit. And I, I wanted to have a group that could do that. And um, I was looking for something, kept looking, heard about different things. And a guy rang me up, a publisher friend, who said he'd heard a group um, that might be interesting. And he sent their manager along to see me. And my wife was my secretary at that time, and she made a little note in my diary saying, Mr. Bernard Epstein to see you. Well, of course, it wasn't Bernard, it was Brian. And that was it. That was 1962. And um, the rest you know. Well, what was your impression when you heard it? Well, I didn't, I didn't turn somersaults or anything. They were... They were there were four, four guys making a noise. Um, and I, I wasn't impressed with their music. The songs they wrote were pretty awful. But the sound was different. And, but the thing that really made me decide to give them a lousy contract, because it was a lousy contract for them, it was fine for me, was the fact that they had this great charisma. I felt for them. I fell in love with them. I could see them, and I could, they charmed the pants off me. You know, the first day when I asked them into the control room to listen to what we'd done, I said, if, if there's anything you don't like, let me know. And George Harrison said to me, well, I don't like your tie for a start. And I <laughs> which, which was audacious, mm -hmm. and it was a terrible thing to say, but everybody fell around laughing. And I thought, cheeky devil. And I loved them for that. And they were just, they never changed. 
So I sign them on the basis of what they were, not what they could do as musicians. <laughs>